I need help. I've been trying to shortlist my ideal representatives, you know, for a court hearing, but I accidentally took a look at the best representatives for brands across the world. I mean, it's a decently foolproof plan, right? If someone can represent an entire brand, then surely they can represent one random guy in court. I got 25 to life. But Tony the Tiger told me that, all things considered, this outcome was great. You ever think of Nintendo? Make a stop, 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 make a stop. Well, chances are, if you're thinking of the big N, a certain Italian is going to cross your mind simultaneously. Mario! He looks so normal, doesn't he? Mario is Nintendo's main man. They quite obviously have other IPs and characters that could maybe qualify as a mascot. Link, Samus, hell, even the Inklings are probably in mascot sales territory by now. But I don't think we'll ever quite see a video game character as universally recognisable as Mario. Maybe ever. But I should probably explain what a mascot is before jumping straight into them. That'd be like diving straight into the deep end of the pool without knowing how to swim. Like, I don't know what a Pac-Man is, someone get me out of here! A mascot is your frontrunner, just something that represents your entire company. It might be a singular character, or a franchise, or a series, just anything that makes someone think, yes, that is Capcom. When people think of Sega, they think of Sonic, for example. When people think of Nintendo, they might think of a character like Mario, or Link, or a series like Pokemon or something. With PlayStation, it could be Kratos, or maybe Nathan Drake, or maybe Sackboy for the entire like it's rated E for everyone. And with Xbox... Um... I... I, um... Cool. But that'll all be discussed in due time. For now, let's get back to Nintendo. Nintendo have been around since way, way, way back when. Pretty sure this company predates SMS texting, that's how old it is. But as they started to dip their toes into the video game market, it seemed like their mascot could have been Game & Watch. Yeah, Game & Watch, this little ink black dude was the start of Nintendo's initial consoles. Little handheld micro games like Super Mario Bros, The Legend of Zelda, and... Ball. But a faithful day in the low life slums known as the arcades would give birth to Nintendo's true icon. And no, unfortunately, it wasn't Donkey Kong. No, our titular character ended up being none other than Jumpman. So he can jump. Oh, big f***ing whoop. He's called Jumpman because he can jump. That's great. Can I be called Hopman because I can hop? Uh, I think we can all see where this story is going at this point. In 1985, Super Mario Bros. launched alongside a number of other black box NES games, effectively rebooting the North American video game market from scratch. Free cheers to the plumbing industry for solving everyone's problems yet again. At this point, Mario was named, had colour, if you're colourblind, and was placed on an incredibly popular home console. He could pretty much stumble his way into becoming top dog at this point. Two and one deals, sequels, fake sequels, real sequels, spin-offs, handheld spin-offs, TV shows, live action segments, live action movies, so, okay, wait, is being a mascot actually a bad thing? I mean, don't get me wrong, I don't think his video game characters are sat at home crying their eyes out of the gruelling work they put in as mascots of their respective companies. But think about the developers, for example. If you're a development team tasked with making a Mario game, you're gonna have eyes on you. Ubisoft developed games like the Mario and Rabbids... Series. Oh, hi, I'm introducing a Bill of Rights. It's called the Remove Mario and Rabbids Sparks and Hope from Existence so we don't have to pretend that a Mario and Rabbids crossover game spawned a series, Bill of Rights. It's for public safety. Normally people look at a Ubisoft game and go, eh, okay, whatever, and throw it away after using it as a placemat for the last month of its life. But when people's precious plumber gets involved, things start to get a little different. I might be absolutely eating my words here because Mario and Rabbids turned out to actually be two Please support the cause. surprisingly good titles, but I can think of plenty of examples where a new or alternative development studio mismanages a company's mascot. Like Pokemon, for example. Let's see here. Ah, Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. Released just recently in 2022, Scarlet and Violet were both criticised for insane performance. Oh, what was that? Oh, oh, these were the ones made by Game Freak. Christ. Modern day Game Freak isn't just a whole other can of worms. It may as well be the worm to end all worms. But recently, the Pokemon company has been lending out the series to a number of other development studios that develop spin-offs. Or more infamously, remakes. Seeing how the Pokemon company primarily put out a series called Pokemon, it's pretty hard not to consider them a mascot, especially when you see Nintendo's sales numbers regarding the franchise. So when a support studio like ILCA takes over one of the most highly anticipated remakes of the series, it raises some concerns. Yup, Pokemon Brilliant Diamond and Pokemon Shining Pearl. I don't own either of these games. 
Fuck my life. Oh no, I don't own two video games. Whatever will I do? The Diamond and Pearl remix have been hounded after for what felt like centuries at this point. Immediately after the release of Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, the Generation 4 nostalgia wave came and hit like crack. Constant speculation and begging for them as Pokemon's Sun, Moon, Ultra Sun, Ultra Moon, Sword, Shield. I am starting to notice a problem. All of these games came out until finally, after a grand total of... Seven years of waiting, Christ, we're impatient. The main criticism of the game came from a chibi art style. It was more reminiscent of a sprite work from the DS games, and sort of maybe the early 3D games if you squint. But people interpreted it as a step back for the series, saying the game didn't add enough compared to the originals. And can you blame them? When you look at the Generation 3 remakes adding things like Latias flying in the Delta episode, seeing nearly nothing new here must have stung a little. But the way people talk about these games... I mean, the stock footage is here for a reason, they literally treat them like Satan spawn. They're still Diamond and Pearl, from what I could tell, they're not terrible games, but with a label like Pokemon, and especially being Pokemon games that have been speculated on forever now, people expected big, big things, and when they don't get those big, big things, they have big, big reactions. So, what was the result of all this? Is this gonna tarnish your Pokemon brand? No. It's a Pokemon game. This thing could roll over, yawn, scratch its ass, and sell 15 million units. It's not special. It was ILCA's first ever solo project. If the only things you developed are Pokemon Home and Pokemon Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl, uh, just take a six month gap here and come back, dude. Like, that's not gonna get you anywhere. So when the Gen 4 remix are received poorly and ILCA is to blame, People lose trust in those developers, and that becomes more of an issue for them than the mascot franchise itself. But, of course, things could always be worse. You could be the main developers of a mascot franchise and consistently make bad to decent games. So, without further ado, let me introduce you all to Not Game Freak. Uh, do I have to say it? Like, do you really want me to say the line? C uh, come on, you know, you know the one. Ugh, fine. Sonic has had a rocky transition to 3D. I hated every syllable of that sentence. From absolutely dominating the forefront of millennials' minds in the 90s to moving into 3D on the Dreamcast of Sonic Adventure was an interesting experience. I wouldn't say any 3D Sonic game buying you was actually bad per se, but that'll change with the release of Sonic the Hedgehog. No, not the bad to decent to good to great game from 1991. No, not the bad to bad to bad to bad port on the Game Boy Advance from 2006. No, I'm talking about that, Sonic the Hedgehog. Sonic 06 released as a pretty rushed mess to make a Christmas deadline, so Sonic Unleashed was released pretty quickly to try and save us IP. It was okay, let's move on at the speed of sound of Generations, which finally proved that 3D Sonic could work. Just in the nick of time. <laughs> Sonic would then later reach his oh god, oh fuck, 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 era and slowly begin to stumble out of it with the release of Sonic Frontiers in 2022. And even that was just like... Okay. I know, the phrase has been beaten to death, brought back to life, and beaten to death again. But Sonic in 3D has really been rough. Especially the ones developed by Sonic Team. The ones you'd expect to be good. Even they can be pretty bad. And Sonic is undoubtedly the mascot of Sega. So if his kids can't find consistency, then that can reflect badly on Sega as a publisher. Or even Sonic Team as developers. I'm truly relieved that Sonic Frontiers is a 7 out of 10 at worst. Because for a while there, things looked like they were on the rocks for Sonic. Now PlayStation on the other hand. Yep, got a feeling they're doing just fine. PlayStation has what I like to call a revolving door of mascots. Characters like Kratos, Nathan Drake, Sackboy, Aloy, how even Astrobot seeing how he was included with every PS5 without consent. My opinion is incredibly biased because I'm coming off the back of a hearty God of War Ragnarok playthrough, but my personal pick for a mascot of PlayStation would probably be Kratos. He's been around since the PS2 era, evolved with PlayStation and the rest of their first party IPs incredibly seamlessly. The only problem is his tendency to do this and that and also a few of these. That's another thing mascots sort of have to do. Be marketable. Something like Kratos may not fly with a wide, wide audience, especially if that wide, wide audience involves children. I mean, having a family's ash and blood stuck to your skin permanently is fine by me, but that axe looks a little Peggy 18 in my eyes. But even then, there's so many other IPs you could pick other than Kratos. Sly Cooper, Rapper the Rapper, Ratchet and Clank, so much PG content here on the PlayStation console. Please mind the blood, I swear to God, we're renovating. I think, somehow, PlayStation does this no one true mascot thing right. I mean, it at least does it better than the alternative. Xbox really does feel like an odd one out when it comes to having a mascot. Even if I do feel like a Nintendo nerd saying this, 
It's just what I think. I mean, ultimately, it doesn't matter. Halo arguably works well enough as a mascot despite falling from grace in the last couple of years. And Game Pass is clearly showing people just how much variety Xbox has on their platforms. Like, holy sh**, they got Power Wash Simulator on this thing. We gotta make this guy the face of Xbox. And after looking at all of that, I think I know who I want my next court representative to be. I picked the rabbit. And I got the chair.